Okay. So following from uh, Architect Poco's presentation on the kind of network connectivity, I'm going to talk to you about why uh, we have insanely tried to solve the wrong problem over and over and over again. Okay. Oops. All right. This is a graph or a diagram you need to see. And if you remember nothing else of my presentation, this is what you should remember, right? So this is the vicious cycle of car-based uh, planning and car-based solutions, right? So the more we the more we build roads, the more we respond to traffic, the more uh, vehicles and cars come onto the roads, the more congestion we have, the more roads we build, and it gets worse and worse, and we chase our own tail. So we never solve this problem because traffic congestion is not the problem to solve. Transportation is what we need to solve. And that's getting from one place to the other. And the car is not the only way to do that. Okay. All right. Here are your takeaways. And this is what I'm going to talk about. And I'll review at the end. Uh, traffic is congestion is real. It happens in nearly every city, nearly every big city in the world. Okay. In fact, if you don't have traffic congestion, you likely don't have a very strong urban economy. Um, you can't build your way out of traffic congestion in terms of building more roads. And there are mathematical reasons for this. And this takes off really, really well with architect Popo, what Architect Popo just told you. Uh, all traffic cities that have, that have vibrant economies have traffic congestion. And traffic congestion is a geometry problem. Okay, that's it. You can take, take that screenshot. And if you, anyone quizzes you on what I said, this is what, you, uh, this is what I talked about. All right. Uh, some numbers, right? Let's... So Parrex is meant to solve vehicular, mostly private car traffic, right? So they've come back and said, we're going to put a BRT, we're going to put bike lanes. You don't put bike lanes on elevated highways. Uh, and the existing elevated highways we have, we don't provide public transit on that. Anyway, here's the car ownership of the Philippines, right? The number of households that actually own cars, 5.9%. Right? Less than less than ten percent, five point nine percent. That's all of the Philippines. So these are the car owning uh, 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 families or households in the Philippines. If your family owns a car, you are part of that tiny minority. Metro Manila car ownership is a little higher, eleven point five percent. Households own cars, and most of the households that can own a car actually own maybe two. Right, because of one and a half or two, right, in terms of, of, of numbers, because uh, you, that was driven in part by needing to drive everywhere and also vehicle volume reduction programs like coding, where uh, you realize that if I have two different plate numbers, I can use dif different cards on every day. Right, um, here's the big number 80%, uh, or somewhere between, between 80 and 80, 78 and 82 percent, depending on the survey you take. That's the, the number of people or commuters who are dependent on public transportation, who use public transportation. Let me rephrase that in a different way. Uh, eight out of every 10 people in Metro Manila uh, use public transportation. Right? And yet the solutions we keep trying, the, the thing we're trying to solve, traffic, also affects people in public transportation, but we solve it for um, private vehicles rather than solving for more efficient public transportation. Okay, uh, here's another big number. This is the total number of new private cars we added to our roads between 2010 and 2020, right? One decade, nearly half a million new vehicles. Right. And this is important when I come back to you and why it's a geometry problem. That means every day from 20 to the start of 2010 till the end of 2020, uh, every day we were adding about 120 new cars into our roads. Right. Why will we have congestion? Because we have more cars. And then this is the problem we've been trying to solve for decades, right? So uh, we built out EDSA, right? As, as, uh, and, built out the remaining circumferential roads. But we started with EDSA um, and we said there was traffic congestion at either end. So we built out the Balintua Cloverleaf in the 1970s and then Magallanes Interchange in 1973. This is still under construction there. Uh, and said, yes, this will solve traffic, traffic congestion, because that's what we need. Of course, 
uh, Magallanes is one of the worst intersections and continues to be, right? Uh, and then we did this in Cubao too, right? And all along EDSA, as the years progress, it was traffic was the problem. The new interchange will solve it. The new overpass will uh, solve it. The new uh, uh, flyover will solve it, right? And we kept trying to solve it. Uh, did we? So, no, right? And every time we come back, we'll spend billions of dollars trying to make um, uh, tra vehicular traffic flow faster. Maybe if we add this new flyover, it'll solve it. It solves it for a, a few years or so, and I'll show you why and, and architect Poco had talked about induced demand. What they never show in these fancy pictures is the underside of the skyovers. They look like this. Right? Um, and this is on a day without traffic and it's horrible for people. Uh, and within a few years, you get traffic congestion by sheer volume. So why does that happen? It's induced traffic. So what happens is, Two charts on uh, on the left side is here's the congestion that happens in a particular roadway, and it plateaus. And then we say we need to build a uh, new capacity, so we'll add capacity or we'll build a new road, and traffic gets generated because then more people will take that uh, road because it supposedly has less traffic, uh, and also or more people buy cars because that's what you're privileging, right? So the chart on the right side is uh, from Turkey with a new bridge that they built and then they expanded. And within a few years, right, two to three years usually, uh, you get congestion again. And then here's the mathematical reason. I'll go a little bit into a mathematical explanation of Brace paradox, which works in all networks, but this was particularly of, of uh, road networks. Right, Adding one more road, a fast road to a network actually slows down traffic. I'll see, show it to you with a simple, model, you can go to YouTube and look for these kinds of explanations. They usually use the same explanation. So let's say two, two points, A and B. And let's say there are two routes to A, to, uh, to A and to, to B. These are roads, right? And the roads are consist of one very fast road that takes you 10 minutes if there are only 100 vehicles and a standard road that doesn't get congested and don't, only takes 20 minutes. Um, that's the congested road though, the congestible road, uh, takes 20 minutes if there are more if there are 200 vehicles so it's a volume problem right so because it's about the same then the cars divide the same way if you had 200 vehicles going from a to, to b then 100 will take the northern route and another 100 vehicles will take the southern route because all in all it takes you about you know 30 minutes right to get through now let's say you build in a new no traffic road, very wide expressway to connect those two fast seg segments, right? So theoretically, you can now take the 10 minute road into the zero traffic road all the way to the other 10 minute road. Voila, it'll take you just 20 minutes. That's the promise of expressways like Parex. But what actually happens mathematically, right? What happens is everyone wants to take that route. And so, uh, and you remember that those first parts of those routes, uh, think in terms of where these exit ramps go, think in terms of the exits of the South Superhighway or the Skyway, right? They get congested. So instead of being able to handle uh, 10 minutes for 100 vehicles, with, 20, with 200 vehicles, it takes 20 minutes to cross that. And so now you have 20 minutes, the zero minutes very fast, a skyway or expressway, and then another 20 minutes on the other side because it gets congested. Now it actually takes 40 minutes. Okay? So adding a new road, and this works brace paradox has been observed on traffic networks and telecom networks, uh, actually makes traffic worse for everyone. Uh, the, the reverse is true. If you remove the road, it actually improves traffic for everyone. Okay, this has been proven. New York experience. In 1990, New York, 42nd Street, which crosses Manhattan, key vehicle route, they were gonna close it down. And everyone said, it's gonna be horrible. Traffic is going to be really, really bad. It's going to be doomsday. Uh, they closed it. Headline from the New York Times, nothing happened. Traffic actually flowed better. Then 2019, you know, uh, they closed down 14th Street to make it exclusive busway. And everyone was saying the same thing. Oh my God, it's going to be traffic. 
uh, Carmageddon and and it's all you know uh, it's going to be terrible and and traffic actually got better that was two decades apart in the middle 2009 they crossed Broadway which was a north south route uh, where Times Square is and and they made they pedestrianized it uh, and the same thing so it's going to be the worst thing uh, it's going to be traffic um, and it didn't you didn't get Carmageddon. Um, they didn't quite reach their goals. Their mathematical model said traffic would be reduced by 37%. Uh, it, traffic was reduced by 17%. So they didn't quite call it a, a whole success, but traffic actually improved by closing down a lot. So Brace Paradox has been proven in London, in Boston, in Seoul. When you remove a, a, a vehicle, it actually gets faster. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, speed up a bit now. I see that my time's coming up. Uh, Lots of cities have removed uh, their high, uh, main highways through this, the, the city and um, tra no traffic nightmare. So it's a feature of economic growth. This is the last one of the last points I'll make. Uh, all of cities everywhere, if you look for the headlines, will show, oh, look at how bad traffic is. And this is the cost of, uh, of traffic. And that's the excuse re usually to build more roads. But... Research is showing the traffic problem accompanies economic growth. Right? This is from Dr. Eric Dernbaugh, and he mapped out traffic delays in American metros. And you think better traffic than a city should be more productive? Actually, the reverse is true. Where congestion is high, the city is economically more, uh, more productive. All right. Finally, two short videos. Traffic is a geometry problem. Uh, I'll show these videos from PTS. It's about a minute each. Uh, I don't know if the sound will go, but let's see. So here's how you would move traffic if you had 200 people each, right? So as you can see, the cars took longer. Okay, let's show another video. Again, this is brief. Oops, sorry. Yeah. All right, this time, let's make them all finish at the same time, right? So they're all gonna finish at the same time. How much space do you need for the cars versus people versus public transportation? All right, I'm wrapping up the only proof and I'm going to leave this here and not explain it because we'll take another uh, another session to do this if we wanted to, right? The only proven way to reduce traffic is to make it more expensive to operate cars, right? Through congestion or road pricing. And you've seen that done in Singapore, in London, in, in Stockholm, Helsinki. Higher parking fees, less parking. Tokyo does that. 
uh, and higher taxes on car ownership. Right? So going back, traffic congestion is real, wrong problem to solve. Most of the people in Metro Manila travel by public transportation. We actually want that. You can't build your way out of traffic congestion with more roads because math. Uh, and all cities have vibrant economies and traffic congestion. So it's a wrong problem to solve, and it's a geometry problem. Uh, so you need to know we need to focus on moving people and not cars. Thank you.